The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is so good to have you, even though we are still continuing in our distanced places of worship with friends and family. It is still so good to join together in this time. Thank you for being here. Next Sunday, the 31st of January, will be a special day here at First Presbyterian Church. Our morning worship will be led by our mission partners uh, living in Lebanon. They are doing work with, in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Elmarie Parker and Scott Parker, they will be sharing that work with us and then also giving us uh, scripture and a message. So you'll want to be here with us for worship next Sunday, especially. And then in the afternoon, from 2 to 3, right here in first, the First Presbyterian parking lot, we are hosting a drive-through event for the entire community. Uh, a bowl of soup, a container of soup will be given, and we also have hygiene bags to pass out. Many, many of you have donated so generously. Uh, the office is filling up with things that we will be able to share uh, next week with our neighbors here in Worcester. I'm uh, grateful to a Amy Backstrom, our Director of Family Ministries, for setting all of that up. I do want to highlight opportunities for you to participate in our worship. If you would like to serve as a liturgist, either coming into the sanctuary and recording uh, by yourself or recording from home, if you would be willing to offer the prayers of the people, and also if you would like to give flowers in memory of or dedication to uh, someone, uh, please call the church office, let us know, or type an email message into our website and we'll be glad to put your name on the list. And then, most especially, coming in February, will be a new sound system, sound and recording system, video recording system, uh, for us here at First Presbyterian. And we are looking for volunteers who would be willing to go through training and occasionally uh, sit up in the booth, uh, like, uh, like our Rachel does every week recording, and um, we need, we'll need some help as we go forward. And if we get enough volunteers, then no one uh, gets saddled with it for too much time. So do invite you to participate in our worship in those ways of volunteering and, um, and giving. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning, and welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Epiphany. Today's service music comes from three French composers of the 19th and 20th century, today presented in chronological order. First of all, César Franck, the father of the Romantic organ in France. He had the good fortune to live at the same time as the organ builder, Cavier Cole, and the two of them together had a symbiotic relationship and both worked to advance what we think of as the symphonic organ or romantic organ in France throughout their time. The piece today you'll hear is an excerpt from his Grand Pièce Symphonique, and you'll hear the melody presented in this case on the crumb horn, a close relative of the clarinet in the organ world. The musical offering today comes from Louis Vienne, who was legally blind through most of his life and served at Notre Dame again for many decades. Um, this particular lullaby was written uh, so that it could be used as an offertory, so perhaps Vieren realized that adults as well as children could use the calming. To my ear, the infant gets restless in the middle of this piece and then is comforted by the father's voice, which appears in the pedal, and in the concluding section by the mother singing in a different room. The postlude is by Jean Langley, another blind French composer organist who attended the National Institute for Blind Children in Paris, an institution that was founded in 1785 and in 1826 started its own organ class. Within seven years, he, the institute had 14 organists serving throughout Paris and that condition, 
that uh, tradition continued into the 20th century. The piece is entitled Pasticcio, which normally in music means a mixture, um, often by, of pieces by various composers, but in this case, I think just a humorous uh, title applied by Langley. As I was preparing the pieces this morning, it occurred to me that each of these three composers uh, was introduced to me by one of my three organ teachers, although I didn't actually study these three particular pieces with any of those teachers. And it reminds me that great teachers not only teach, but they also open new doors and windows for us all. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. We enter this space for worship, called by God to pray together. We enter this space for worship, called by God to share our lives together. We enter this space for worship, called by God into Sabbath rest. We enter this space for worship, leaving behind the week that has gone. We enter this space for worship and to be refreshed for the worship in our daily lives. We enter this space for worship, worshiping the God who calls us ever onward. Come, let us walk in the light and listen for God's voice. Let us pray. Gracious God, in any and all times, you are with us. You call us to discipleship. You invite us into relationship with one another and with you. In the moments of this time of worship, may we experience your call, your community, your grace, and be led to respond with our lives. Amen. Please pray with me now our prayer of confession, and then I invite you to pray silently. Forgive us, God of unrelenting mercy, for the times we have run the other way, rather than enter the territory of those we do not like, those who have hurt us, those we consider our enemy. Forgive us for the times we have resented your forgiveness of those we consider not worthy. Forgive us for the times we have wallowed in anger and self-pity, rather than rejoice in the bounty of your love for all people. Forgive us for putting boundaries around your mercy and borders on your forgiveness. Help us to see ourselves as children of the most merciful one, sisters and brothers, all of whom you have created. Help us to forgive those who sin against us as you forgive us too. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. This is the good news, my friends. God remembers us and forgives us and calls us so that we might live as people of love and hope for the sake of all creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now please turn to those around you if you are worshiping with others this morning and offer a gesture of peace. And for those who may be tuning in alone and not surrounded by others, may you offer a gesture and posture of peace as we share the peace of Christ with those in our whole world. The peace of Christ be with you. Hello! So Christmas is over and probably all your Christmas decorations are put away and it is a thought of last year. Maybe not. Maybe we're still hanging on to some of that Christmas cheer. But this time in our liturgical calendar is called Ordinary Time. And if you're familiar with the color wheel of our, of our liturgical calendar, Ordinary Time is green. Now, in my opinion, there is nothing ordinary about this time. And green is a great symbol about our growth and what we can do during this ordinary time. We certainly know that 2020, and even so far 2021, has not been ordinary. But on the liturgical calendar, this is the time that we get to prepare. 
And if you think about outside, there's not a whole lot that's green outside right now. But in a few months, we're going to have spring, and the snow will be melted, and underneath that snow and cold blanket that has covered our grass this winter, our, our um, flowers and our grass are starting to grow. So during this ordinary time, all the nutrients and all the rest and all the things that the grass and the flowers and the trees need, they're getting right now in this ordinary time. So I wanted to challenge us because Lent will be here soon and Easter will be upon us and spring will be here. And as we prepare for those things during this ordinary green time, think about some ways that we can prepare and grow ourselves. So as an adult, I can read the Bible, I can go to Bible studies, I can teach things, I can talk with people. And as a kid, you can too. So I want to challenge all of us to think about this ordinary green time. And don't just lay dormant and die. Think about ways that you can nourish your body and your mind and your soul spiritually, physically, what are some things that you need in this ordinary time so that when our green is showing outside and our spring is here, we know that we have felt God's presence in our bodies getting us ready for the Lent and the new season that's coming. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these ordinary times, this green time in our lives, that we can sit in your spirit and listen for your words so that we can grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in prayer. We enter to worship today with full minds, O oh God, full of anger and frustration, full of pain, of doubt and confusion. We come hoping to grow in faith so that we may grow closer to you. We pray today for those around the world who are suffering from disasters, natural and man-made. Refugee camps around the world, those who suffer from hurricanes and flooding, those who are fleeing violence, poverty, and oppression as they leave their home countries, running, they hope, to safety. May they know your comforting spirit, we pray. We pray today for our country as we see those who have lost loved ones from this awful coronavirus, for those who have suffered from gun violence while they have the simple acts of gathering together, to those who are overlooked in their time of greatest need. May they know your comforting spirit, we pray. We pray today for those in our own community neglected children whose parents suffer from addiction, for those who have lost jobs and all the greater losses that come with it, loved ones who suffer from life's many disappointments, and all those we hold in our hearts. May they know your comforting spirit, we pray. When we hear the words of scripture, we are told that you, O oh God, are the great comforter of our suffering. We ask that you strengthen us today. Give us courage to look at our own lives and see that we may act to help those in need. Give us wisdom to find the right actions and give us faith to go forward so that we may be your comforter here on earth. We look to the words of Jesus as we seek comfort and remember his words as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I would think that most anyone likes a good story. After all, cable television and online internet sources are doing a booming business, and our Facebook pages and email inboxes are flooded daily with the latest heartwarming anecdote. Surely, the compelling power of stories has always existed. From prehistoric family groups huddled around a, a fire at the mouth of a cave, hearing tales of the great hunt, to children snuggled down in their beds listening once again to their favorite bedtime book. Our stories shape us. They remind us of who we are and where we are in that great story that is life. The same holds true for the stories we call sacred, the stories collected in our scriptures. The Bible is mostly a storybook, a collection of the great mythic tales passed down from generation to generation that have had the power to shape people and form communities in distinctive ways. To these sacred stories, we add our own story, telling them here in this place or in other places where two or more are gathered together. Our Christian narratives are dependent upon the ancient Jewish narratives that provide the bedrock of our scriptures. These Jewish midrashim, or interpretations of scripture, inform our readings and interpretations even today. A winsome example is this. The story told about a great rabbi who had the sacred custom prior to each Shabbat of retreating to a most serene and isolated place in the woods, lighting a fire of unique and symbolic structure, all the while ceremoniously chanting a haunting and provocative melody. After the rabbi died, the disciples of the, this great rabbi forgot how to find the place in the woods. So they merely built the fire and chanted the melody. After these rabbis died, their disciples did not know how to find the place in the woods, and they forgot how to build the appropriate fire. So they merely chanted the melody. After these rabbis died, their disciples did not know how to find the place in the woods or build the fire, and they forgot how to chant the correct melody. So, these rabbis told the story. The story of Jonah may have been passed down in a similar way, as a commentary or critique on some part of the Torah. This story now holds a most special place in the history of Judaism. It is read at the beginning of every year on the most holy day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Let us hear the opening chapter of the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came up upon the sea 
that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, Jonah replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. Jonah said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up, and threw him into the sea, and the sea quit raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What follows next in the story is a poem or hymn of thanksgiving from Jonah to the Lord for his rescue from the sea. This is a good message for the Day of Atonement. Jonah runs away from God, but God comes looking for him, delivers him from drowning, and sets him on dry land. Disobedience, repentance, deliverance. This is the good news of God's grace for the start of the new year. But the story continues. When Jonah is called again by God to go to Nineveh, he goes. But as we will hear in chapter 3, he was not happy about it. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, 
covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. God may turn from God's fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God said would be brought upon them, and God did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And why wouldn't Jonah be angry? Nineveh, located in what is today Iraq, was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The ruthless and brutal Assyrians had conquered the Middle East all the way to the borders of Egypt. They had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and had killed or enslaved much of its population. For Jonah, judgment and retribution were what the Assyrians deserved. For the destru destruction caused by Assyria, Nineveh should be destroyed. In his anger, and desire for revenge, Jonah was merely echoing other stories in the Bible where judgment is swift and terrible. Jonah remembered the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But to Jonah's dismay, in this story, the people repent, even the hated Assyrians. And God changes God's mind and does not destroy, but forgives. And this is the deeper message of the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. God forgives and restores not just the chosen people, but all people, even the enemy. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give him shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down upon the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, 
you are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand persons who do not know their left hand from their right, and also many animals? Every year, down through the centuries, even in the midst of persecutions and pogroms, faithful Jews have heard the story of Jonah. The story tells them that God has compassion for all, even for their enemies. As they start each new year, faithful Jews are reminded to go and practice such compassion. The story of Jonah is our story as well. And it is just as difficult and shocking for us as it is for our Jewish sisters and brothers. This is the scandal of God's mercy, the good news of God's grace. It comes to those we love and to those we hate to those who seem to deserve it, and to those who do not. Jonah tried to run from, from it, but God's love caught him anyway. And God's love still catches us. We are invited to be storytellers in our day and our time, we will tell stories with the words we say, but more importantly, we will tell stories with the lives we live. May our lives reflect God's compassion. For the good news to Ninevites then and now is that we and they are embraced in the steadfastly compassionate love of God forever. Amen.
healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. You who know each thought and feeling, teach us all the way of healing. Spirit of compassion, fill each heart. May we strive for the spirit of compassion. May that be the theme for each of us this year, individually and corporately, as we hope to come together in our worshiping communities once again. Let us live, live each day into compassion. And as you leave worship, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever. You are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always. Together, we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness, loving and compassionate service this and every day of our lives. And may God's hope peace, joy, and love always abide with you. Amen.